Hello, my friends. Welcome to Lunch with Friends and Strangers, Carolina Public Humanities Biography Program. It's our first session of the summer. Um, I can see a few people starting to load in here. It's good to see you. I know we're all getting a little bit of Zoom fatigue. Um, I am happy to say, however, that you'll be able to find our Lunch with Friends and Strangers programs um, on YouTube. Certainly, um, we, we delay on these about five or six months and then put them on, but we already have a wonderful collection on our YouTube channel. I need to thank a few people before we begin here. I want to, of course, thank Paul Bonici um, and a very happy birthday to Paul, whose birthday was yesterday and who worked on his birthday helping us put on that wonderful show pan program. So thank you, Paul, for all the work you're doing for Carolina Public Humanities. Um, also, I, of course, want to thank um, Vicki Breeden, um, Susan Landstrom, and everyone else who is uh, uh, helping us monitor this program today. Um, the, uh, we certainly want to thank our sponsors, the Cotton Market Group and Morgan Stanley, helping to underwrite our K-12 programs, and uh, the Carolina Meadows, a wonderful sponsor of both our public facing and, Carol and Carolina K-12 programs. Our sponsoring partners, the General Alumni Association, with whom we put on all sorts of wonderful programs, including this one, and the North Carolina yeah, North Carolina Society, with whom we do extensive teacher workshops and who have been underwriting, uh, especially our North Carolina focused teacher workshops. So thank you for our, our sponsors and partners. We are so grateful for your support. Uh, we also want to remind folks that we do have programming at humanities.unc.edu. Uh, you can find all sorts of wonderful programs for the summer, including more of these Lunch with Friends and Strangers, uh, and of course our weekend seminars, including our Juneteenth seminar. Uh, we have a seminar tomorrow actually coming up on Native American monuments. Our Juneteenth seminar uh, the following weekend uh, on Ella Baker and Barack Obama. And at the end of the month on June 26, we'll have Conceptions of Time, a multi uh, interdisciplinary look at, at just that topic, Conceptions of Time. And we are excited to announce that um, last night we had our first attempt at a hybrid live program and we are happy to see some actual people in the audience. And June 26 will be another opportunity for you to see us live. So um, there will be, it'll be both offered online and live, and it'll be held at Silver Spot Theater. Go to humanities.unc.edu for more information on that. Uh, we hope to see some folks. It's, it's almost, it's surreal, but it's happening. We're starting to be live folks again in 3D. Okay, well, you know what Lunch with Friends and Strangers is all about. Um, uh, I, Max Orr, talk with a friend who is a faculty member at the University of North Carolina, and that friend brings along a stranger, somebody that we maybe have heard of, but that we need to know better, or someone we maybe have never heard of at all. So let's start by introducing our friend. I'm going to ask our friend to turn on his camera, and that is Professor of Biology. David Fenning. How are you, David? And we'll unmute you as well. You know this. I like to say there's this how many minutes of time have been lost in the world to please unmute yourself, but you did that very quickly. Welcome, David. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. I would say a quick bio. We're not going to read any CV, so I'm just going to say we're going to drop uh, your bio there so people can look, look you up, but you're doing great work in the biology department. Uh, looking at development, ecology, uh, and, and uh, evolution, the interplay between them. Really fascinating talks. You've come and given talks with us here at Carolina Public Humanities. That's one of the things we love about the biology department uh, is that you are all fantastic humanist scientists. So thank you for coming and sharing a little bit of your knowledge with us uh, in a non-laboratory setting. Delighted to have you. Um, the next thing we need to do is, of course, we need to introduce everybody to our stranger. So let's bring up our stranger right now, and I will just share the screen. And there we have our stranger. Did everybody see that? Marianne, are you seeing that, David? I am, thank you. Okay, so here she, here she is, Mary yeah. Anning. Um, we have this quotation, discoverer of spectacular fossils overlooked by a scientific community dominated by men. Who is Mary Anning? And, and why should we pay attention to her? So Mary Anning, as you can see, um, you know, lived about you know, 200 years ago, um, you know, and so she um, was somebody who um, really made some of the really critical discoveries that we just sort of take for granted now about um, both how life looked like uh, in the past, in the deep past, um, but the fact that, you know, the earth has been around for a long time. Um, so she helped not just our understanding of life, but our concepts of time. Um, she was not somebody who was uh, a scientist. Um, you know, she wasn't a professional at this. I mean, she basically did this for a living. She found fossils for a living. 
Um, but, you know, she was really somebody who, even during her time, was largely ignored, you know, by the people who took advantage of her discoveries. And so, um, and yet she just kept persevering and persevering and uh, spent her life uh, making these amazing discoveries um, that, that um, are, were so important to science. And largely ignored during the time, but able to be productive enough to be remembered and to, to hit some of the right people. We'll talk in a little bit about who she interchanged with and how she got known by enough people in her time. So she was um, engaged in, in a fossil hunting, basically, and fossil That's selling. Right. Um, and so that was, a, I'm going to quickly just switch over here to just point out the area that we're talking about in, in England. Uh, so this area here, um, why why this area? What's so particular about Dorset? Yeah, so, and I, and I should go back and say, it wasn't so much that she was like, ignored as much as uncredited, right? So yeah. people knew about her, right? And they took advantage of her discoveries. It was just a fact that she didn't get credit for. So her family um, uh, was from this area of, uh, in, in Dorset along the southern coast of England, uh, specifically in this little town of Lyme Regis, which has got circled there. Um, and this is where her father and her mother um, moved to um, before uh, Mary was born. And so what's spectacular about this area is that um, this is a really rich um, uh, place to look for fossils, right? And so um, the, the cliffs along the, the, the coast here, along the English Channel, are just uh, loaded with um, fossils of life from um, over 100 million years ago, right? So it's about, you know, from age from about 200 to about 145 million years ago. Um, and so uh, she was, you know, fortunate, and that's where, where she grew up. And mm -hmm. so she had ready access to these, um, to these fossils that um, she started finding and basically making a living out of finding so and selling. We're going to look at those cliffs in a little bit and talk, but I'd like right. to know about her family. So um, what type of family, where, where were her parents involved in and why did they, do you know where they moved from and why they moved to this area? So they were, they were, from, they were from another small town near Lyme Regis um, in uh, Dorset. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know much more about them than that. Um, they, um, Lyme Regis is, a, is an old town. It had been there for, um, for, for, for centuries, really. It was a port and, and one of the most in, important English ports. Um, they have a, a man-made breakwater there that forms the harbor. It's called the, the Cobb. So it's a 600-foot jetty that, that um, protects the, the harbor there. Um, and so it was, you know, it was always known as a really significant harbor, again, going back to the 13th century. And um, really what happened is that around the turn of the 19th century, um, it became this famous spa town. And so people began moving there, you know, to take advantage of um, going in the water there. And so her father and her mother, when they were newly married, they moved to Lyme Regis. He was a cabinet maker. And so he wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, specifically taking advantage of the, of the water or anything like that. Um, but um, he started on the side finding these fossils in the cliffs there. And, uh, and he started uh, realizing that he could sell these fossils to tourists that were coming into the town because again, it was this popular spa place. Um, and he started making sort of a living that way. Do you have a sense that people were already selling these fossils? It, it, how, how long had been people sort of noticing these and finding these in, of interest? I mean, obviously, fossils have been around for a long time, so it wasn't the right. first time they were found, right? Yeah, so so for many people, these were just curiosities, right? And so they, they didn't necessarily know them as being um, the remains of, I mean, to, what a fossil is, just to remind everyone, it's just the remains of past life. And so the people at the time, you know, this is around, um, you know, in the late, late 1700s, uh, many people didn't recognize that these were actually objects, you know, representing the, the remains of once living life. They were just odd looking rocks, right? And so mm -hmm. um, that attracted attention. And so they were referred to as curiosities. And so really that's what he sold was, he sold, uh, you know, curiosities to folks, mm -hmm. you know, these, these fossilized shells and, and other things like that. And so he was, um, he was a cabinet maker, but he was doing this on the side and that sort of supplanted right. the cabinet making and yeah making it became I mean he, he he stayed a cabinet maker but I think part of it was just you know he enjoyed doing it uh, apparently he was a very um, sort of adventurous sort of uh, charismatic person and so he liked getting out uh, out mm -hmm. of his shop and 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 running along the cliffs and and looking for fossils um, and so you know he just 
you know, he enjoyed uh, doing it. Um, but as I said, he was discovered that he was able to make uh, a living doing this because there was this influx of tourists coming into the area that yeah. were interested in buying this stuff. Just like if the tourists are coming there for the spas, just like anything, if there's, it creates other industries on the side. And one of the, right. one of them is this curiosities industry. Right. So tell me about his right. fam, the family, the Anning family. Was it a large family? Um, many children? So, they, so, so, you know, Richard and his wife was, her name was Molly. Um, and so the, they actually immigrated there to Lyme Regis in 1793. They ended up having 10 children, um, but only two of their 10 children survived. Uh, oh. One of those was Mary. Um, that's and the pretty, other one was that's above the curve, even for the era, I think, in terms of well, maybe. Possibly. I mean, it was, it was obviously, it was a, excuse me, it was a tough time. The only two who survived Mar was Mary, and, and we'll see in a moment, Mary almost didn't survive. And then mm -hmm. her, her older brother, uh, Joseph. Um, and, and they were the only two who, who survived childhood. Um, wow. um, so it was, a, it was a tough life. And so by all accounts, Richard, uh, Mary's father was, as I said, very charismatic. <clears throat> He's described as having somewhat childlike uh, passion, you know, for new challenges. Um, his wife, uh, Molly, was kind of the opposite. She was uh, very serious and cynical, somewhat dour. Um, and so um, we'll see in a moment. Um, Mary sort of naturally took to her father, uh, Richard, and she always had this difficult relationship with her mother, uh, especially after her father passed away. Oh, okay. But her father, as I said, was a, was a cabinet maker, but he was also a dissenter. Um, so these were English separatists. They were, um, they were separated from the Church of England. Um, and they basically, they were opposed to interference by the church mm -hmm. into uh, religious matters. And they tended to, you know, they founded their own churches and um, educational establishments and so forth. But dissenters were, um, they weren't allowed to join the army. They weren't allowed to hold a uh, public sure. office. They couldn't attend university. Um, and so, you know, he was, Richard was constrained in what he could do because of that. And we'll see in a moment, Mary um, also became a dissenter like her mm -hmm. parents. And so again, she couldn't uh, partake of some of these, um, these other uh, aspects of life that, that, that folks uh, could. Um, so um, anyway, so that's kind of the background uh, for the family, um, we, as I said, we don't know a whole lot about the family. Um, Mary was born in 1799. Mm -hmm. um, her, as I said, her, she had an older brother. She was actually named after an, an older sister who was also named Mary, um, who died mm -hmm. in a fire when she was only yeah. four years old. I always so, wonder um, about those kids who take the names of the, of, you know, am right. I myself or am I? <laughs> right. It's very common back then, right? To name the child after the we lost Mary, so you're Mary That's now. Right. That's right. And and when Mary was when Mary was uh, an infant, it it was thought that there was something wrong with her because she was a really um, she didn't eat much, she cried a lot, she coughed a lot, hmm. um, and and so you know there was there was concern that she wasn't going to survive. And um, then this amazing episode happened. And this is one of the interesting things about her life is that when she was um, 18 months old. Um, a nurse took her outdoors to get some fresh air and there was like this festival they were also um, gathering around this festival that was taking place outdoors um and it was during the warm months and so uh, it started raining and a thunderstorm came up and so they took refuge under a large tree nearby. not supposed to do that um, not supposed to do that during a thunderstorm <laughs> and unfortunately you know a lightning bolt hit the tree uh killed the nurse uh killed the other two adult women that were with the nurse and mary uh, all three of them died. Uh, Mary survived miraculously. She survived, um, and then she. It, it said that she was changed thereafter, and so she became uh, a much more, um, uh, you know, uh, interactive and active uh, wow. child after that. So you know, David, weird, I just weird things I, you hear about. I when I hear that story, it makes me think a little bit about Mary Shelley and Frankenstein and the power of electricity, yeah. and were people thinking yeah. about you know she might have gotten the zapped by this. Yeah, romantic charge that changed her and who knows i mean it may be sort of a romantic story um but you know who knows you know how much truth there is to this yeah. but it's that's that's the story that's out there about her so um when she was a young girl um you know after this happened so she started following her father around so she just took to her father you know her, and she and her so, father became really close and so her and, father um, would be her father would be going along Places He'd be like going this, along I... these cliffs, and obviously there wouldn't be all those folks there like they're yeah. using this photo right here. <laughs> uh, but these are some of the cliffs around uh, the area there in Lyme Regis. And um, these, these 
these cliffs, as I said, are loaded in fossils um, of this period called the Jurassic period, which is this, uh, the geological period. Um, that Can you give us the time, remind about. us of how many millions, tens of millions? So of it, started about, it started about 201 million years ago, uh, the Jurassic period, and it ended, it ended about 145 million years ago, right? Okay. So um, it was in yesterday. that span of time. Uh, just yesterday. So actually the rocks around here in Chapel Hill, these sort of reddish rocks you see around here are in the very late Triassic period, which is the geological period just before this. So okay. when the rocks around Chapel Hill were being laid down, um, especially if you get down like below the, down the airport area, you know, in the Jordan Lake where you get the sort of reddish rock, that's immediately before this period uh, took place. But anyway, so he's, he's running around on these cliffs and Mary's going out there with him when she's, you know, five or six years old. And, um, you know, she's she's just becoming her father's constant companion. Um, you know, going out and looking for fossils. Do, so this is a do they walk up enterprise. on the cliffs, David? Do they actually go up? They on they to... did. They would go up on the cliffs, and so uh, the idea is that you actually look for fossils um, on the rubble where these cliffs are sort of uh, eroded down into the ocean. And so these are really unstable cliffs. They're constantly falling down in the ocean. You can see here's a close up. So. What you see here is these these different layers, and so some of those layers are um, what we call silt stones, or or and, and you know where it's like or maybe even a sort of a sandstone type material, and then the the softer stuff in between that you don't see sticking out as much is what we just call shale or mudstone. So mm -hmm. it's just like different different um, depositional environments, you know, that that were taking place uh, over 140 million years ago. It looks doesn't look very stable. It looks like they. It's not at all stable, and so um, this is a, a, a dangerous thing. So even today, they won't let you get along the base of these cliffs because that's you can get killed, and people have been killed um, by the, the cliffs falling on them. Um, in fact, uh, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here, but Mary saw the ended up falling off one of these cliffs um, during his fossil hunting adventures, and um, and then he never actually survived survived that fall. I mean, he was sick uh, for a long time after that, and he ended up dying ultimately of that fall. So and then just, later when go ahead, yeah, go ahead please no you please can say later <clears throat> later when mary it, the picture you showed of her earlier she has her uh, pet dog her cherished uh, pet dog a uh, tray in that photo and trey ended up getting killed by one of these landslides too and mary oh no out looking for fossils so he's and, basically buried so we're gonna have to wait 100 really million years thing. for the fossil of trey the dog Perhaps possibly, possibly. <laughs> so let me ask you one. This is not like finding fossils on, or finding you know shells on the beach. This is a dangerous thing to be doing. Yeah, is, is what I want to stress here. Just, just one question, technical question. Where in this strata would the fossils be? In the rock or in the shale? They, they could be anywhere, but they, they it depends on the fossil you're talking about. Uh, they're probably more in the shale. Than in the in the harder stuff, all right. As so, as a separate piece within the shale, like hard right. fossil. That's so the, sort of so the shale is typically stuff that's like being laid down out in the water. You know, as you're getting just slowly, just sediment sort of filtering out. Um, the harder stuff, if it's more like sandstone, then that'll be stuff that would form like around a beach or something like that. So a lot of the remains of things, you know, be more out in the water as opposed to stay on, on the beach, you know, once when they were alive, right? Yeah. That's why you would find probably more in the shale, but you can find them in both 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 uh, types of rock here. Were they were they doing um dig were they just sifting through or were they doing any digging and excavation at all when they were looking for these well, fossils? they were doing they were doing both, right? So what you do is you go out there and you look for stuff sticking out in the rock. Um, you don't you don't just start digging somewhere yeah. where you don't see anything, right? So you look for a piece of something sticking out, um, and that's how she found many of her greatest discoveries. Is she would just see a glimmer of a little piece of bone or something just sort of sticking out, and then she would start digging in to mm -hmm. find out if there's more in the rock. Mm -hmm. um, and in many cases, there was more into the rock, so it entails both. I just out of curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, were there techniques perhaps frowned upon by current day paleontologists or like what has changed in that excavation? No, that's pretty much the way people do it now. Um, mm -hmm. So they just go out and they, you have to do, you know, what's called prospecting. It's like prospecting for gold or whatever you're going out and you're, you know, you're, nowadays we would know where to go because we would, you know, we would have, you know, she just, she was collecting there because she lived there, right? Nowadays you would say, oh, I want to go look 
the fossils in this kind of rock in North Carolina or Utah or Mongolia or wherever you're going, and you would have a geological map that tells you where the rocks of that age that you were interested in would be um, cropping out on the surface of the earth where you could look for them. Uh, she didn't have that kind of information. Yeah, sure. But pretty much the methods that she used are the methods that people still use today. A um, little bit riskier, you know, what she did back then is what people would do now. Yeah. So uh, her father is selling these curiosities um, and he started, they moved there, you said in 1793? 1793. So, so they start doing that pretty, pretty, is he already involved in that industry or profession? He's if already you will? involved in that before, before she's born. Not before she's, she's born. born 1799. Um, he dies though when she's 11. So he dies around uh, 1810. So she's only 11 years old, at, you know, after he fell off this cliff and they ended up dying. He never, and never sort of recovered from that. She'd be out there with them even before he died and like already right. taking to <clears> this, to this world and he had some success in selling these right. curiosities so right. he did. when her father died did she immediately i mean like she's only 11 i mean what does it tail down for a little while and then she picks up on this so, or does she just go out there so and as, far, as far as we know she just picks up where he left off and and wow. part of that's because of her her fascination with the fossils and just her desire to find them you know her curiosity but frankly, part of it's also just the desperate straits that her family is in, right? And so yeah. the father dies, there goes the income. Back then, also, any debt that the deceased incurred then becomes the family's debt. So they not only have to take care of themselves, now they have to pay off his debt. Um, and, you know, he was a cabinet maker. I mean, the, the mother, her mother Molly, was a homemaker. You know? And yeah. so he was the one bringing in the money. Uh, he, Richard, the father who passed away. And so now Mary has to go out there and it becomes even more essential for her to find fossils to make a living. So Mary, just judging by the reason we're talking about Mary, Mary was really good at this. Was yeah. she facing competition? So um, not so far as we can tell, not at the same level. I mean, no doubt there were probably people going out there finding, you know, fossils, right? And, 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 probably selling them, right? But she became really ardent about it and very, very serious. I mean, if she had any competition at all, it was her older brother, Joseph. And actually Joseph enters our story now. So remember her father dies when she's 11. In 1811, when Mary is only 12 years old, her older brother, Joseph, um, found a four foot fossil skull sticking out of one of these cliffs. Um, and um, he, he's now an apprentice himself learning to be a, a cabinet maker. So he doesn't really have time to dig it out. And he tells Mary about this and he says, you go out there and dig the skull out and find out if there's more uh, to this skull. And so um, Mary worked for weeks on this, um, you know, under again, very, very harsh conditions. A lot of this is happening in the winter time, by the way, that's when the rocks are falling off the cliffs and exposing the fossils. So it's, you know, it's, it's the yeah. storms coming in, it's cold, it's wet. Right on the windy um, she's out there. Yeah. Right on the windy coast. She's out there for weeks digging this thing out. And what she pulls out, this is her big breakthrough. Um, she pulls out a 17 foot uh, fossil of an ichthyosaur, what we now know is called an ichthyosaur. Um, this is a fossil that was 175 million years old. This is the first ichthyosaur that had been um, discovered and described. Um, wow. and so this is a large extinct reptile. I think you have a picture of it. Yeah, I do. I'll pull it up right now. So this is the skull. And there's the skull, and that is the act, that's actually the skull of the ichthyosaur that uh, Mary dug out, uh, that her mm -hmm. brother Joseph first described, or first discovered. And then there, right below the skull on the, on the left side of the screen there, um, that's a picture of a couple of ichthyosaurs uh, as they are thought to look like when they were alive. Um, reptiles, extinct, not fish. They are reptiles, that's right. And so you notice they look remarkably like um, a dolphin, right? Yeah. So. Um, you know, there's Flipper, right? Um, so this is a really interesting example of what we call convergent evolution. So two completely unrelated organisms, in the case of uh, the, the dolphin, um, a, uh, a mammal, in the case of the ichthyosaur, a reptile, um, two completely different groups of organisms that have converged on the same body form because they, they make a living the same way, right? So these are fairly large vertebrae, vertebrate animals that are 
swimming in the ocean um, and they're, they have to be fast, you know, be able to capture prey. And so that's why they have this, this shape. And of course, you know, some sharks look kind of like this as well. And so she's so, also finding these other creatures. She eventually found these other things, but I'm going to just talk about the Icus a little bit more. because Sure, please. She finds this thing and it, it, it's the first one, you know, that's described by science and it gets, so she found, she finds this in uh, 1811, you know, when she was 12 years old, um, she sells it. And she sells it for 23 pounds. Um, and that's, um, that has no meaning to me, but apparently that was enough to feed her mother, her brother and herself for six months and also yeah. to help pay off most of her father's debt. So that was a huge amount of money you know, that she made off this. Um, but unfortunately, so she gets this money, uh, but then when it's, when it's described in 1817 by the King's surgeon and then it's exhibited in London, she's her name doesn't appear anywhere right so there's no yeah. acknowledgement of the young girl the 12 year old girl who actually discovered this fossil um which was you know so spectacular and so and, um we'll know, set a trend know. it seems in much of what she did right <laughs> and and right and so these other these other things that you see there are other fossils that she found so in the upper right there um is what's called a plesiosaur uh, and mm -hmm. that's actually a drawing that she made of her fossil. That's the complete skeleton that she pulled out. Do we know store. when she drew this? She, this would have been uh, sometime later after the exhibit mm -hmm. store. And I'm sorry, I don't know off the top of my head. The exact no, that's date fine. But, but later in life when, so she's getting interested. Later in life, right. She's not just selling these. Uh, she's interested in, I mean, to, to take the time to write this out and kind of imagine it. It might be helpful for her to do the excavation or to th to see these things, but it sounds like just general intellectual curiosity about what this looks she, like. That's a, yes, thank you for making that point. That's a very important point: is that she wants to know more. She can't again. She's she's not. She has had almost no schooling. She can't go to university. You know, as a you know, she's she's you know, she's got three strikes against her. She's a woman. She's poor, and she's a dissenter, right? But she wants to learn more, and so. Um, she she goes to the library and she starts uh, reading books about uh, what's known about uh, the fossils that she's describing um, and discovering. And so she's really trying to educate herself. And she does become quite um, educated in terms of knowing about these discoveries, these fossils she's making, placing them in the proper context, but also learning more about um, what the world might have been like at that time. And you know. Um, so in the lower right is what the what what we think these plesiosaurs look like. Again, these are these are reptiles. These are large. These are not dinosaurs like the ichthyosaurs. These are large reptiles. They're no longer with us, and that's that's one of her important legacies is discovering uh, what past life looked like. There's nothing like these plesiosaurs. There's nothing like ichthyosaurs. Um, and then she also finds in the lower left there, she finds a fossil pterosaur. So this is a flying reptile. So pterodactyls are a type of pterosaur. Uh, pteranodons or type of pterosaur. So she didn't find the first pterosaur, but it was the first pterosaur that had been found outside of Germany. You know, and so it showed that these things, you know, were living, you know, in other parts of the world other than just in, in Germany at the time. So, Dave, so all these are really important discoveries that she doesn't get credit for is the, yeah. is the recurring theme. So David, I want to return to some of the concepts we just hit on, but I just want to go back one picture and just say that this, uh -huh. these are the more common curiosities that were being sold. That's is that right. right? That's and, right. And what are so we looking at So in the upper left here? there are what are, in the upper left are uh, a type of a shelled fossil called uh, uh, ammonites. Um, and these were really common in the Jurassic uh, period uh, when the, the strata that uh, Mary was digging into were, were uh, being laid down. Um, these are now extinct. These went extinct uh, when dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago. Um, their closest relative now are chambered nautiluses, right? So they're in the same group with chambered nautiluses, but they're also in the same group with squids and octopuses. These were an incredibly dominant group of organisms um, for hundreds of millions of years. Uh, again, many of their fossils. And so these are, these are examples of, of some of the fossils that she found, the ammonites. And the middle there on the bottom are um, or what are called belemnites. So these are also in the same group with the ammonites. These are like a fossil squid type thing. And that that structure you see there is kind of the the internal structure in these um, these squid-like creatures. You know that that so uh, use them was to that stabilize a, their body. Is that that's not is that soft? That's not soft tissue that got. It's fossilized. not soft. It's a hard. It's hard tissue, and so it's fossilized. It's hard tissue. So it's kind of like an internal skeleton, almost like what we have, right? Okay. And then in the upper right, um, and I actually. Have 
one here too. These oh, are th th what you see there. These are vertebrae or the I'm going to just quickly stop sharing for one second so they can see the camera oh, a little bit. Yeah. These are uh, parts of the backbones of the ichthyosaurs, right? And so that's what she's also, um, you know, finding um, as well. And so she's selling these and mm -hmm. folks don't know exactly what these are, just like with the, you know, the ammonites, and this is an ammonite, these are both from Lyme Regis. So they don't know exactly what these are, but they're just interesting looking. So people want to buy them, right? And so they want to have them, you know, affluent people, you know, this is what they, what they did, you know, and this this drove a lot of scientific discoveries back in the uh, 19th century was was uh, affluent people in Europe uh, mm -hmm. buying natural history specimens, not just with Mary Anning, but with other folks um, and that made important discoveries in science. At the time. When we were talking with uh, Karin Fennig, we were talking about Joseph Leidy and there was definitely that sort of world of aristocratic you know, bone bone gazing, if you will, and right and speculations. Right. So, what can you tell us about these up and these are in the upper right are the vertebrae. Those are, again, those are the ichthyosaur vertebrae. Ichthyos so that's kind of like the backbone of the okay. ichthyosaur. Okay. So the, when when you're selling, commonly found there. So I mean, I think many modern paleontologists, if they came across an ichthyosaur um, vertebrate, would probably try to preserve it with the rest of it. But they were, hey, this is for sale, right? And that's an issue. Well, she she tried. She did a good job of, of. She understood that a complete skeleton was worth a lot more yeah. financially than a partial skeleton. But she also she appreciated enough of the scientific value of these sample specimens yeah. as well. So she did a, a a fantastic job of trying to keep everything together. So she wasn't just like grabbing, like the skull that her brother found, that ichthyosaur skull. Here she is, you know. Um, 11 years old, and she could have just said, wow, that skull could be worth a lot of money. Let me just take it and go, you know, she understood that, you know, it's important to try to find out if the rest of that animal yeah. uh, was there in the cliff. And that and picture there that she drew, there. right? That's right. The sketch That's there right. she shows that curiosity. I, I'd like to touch a little bit on what people were thinking about species. This is before Darwin. This is before yeah. evolution. Um, this is certainly in a time when, uh, you know, Bishop Usher has declared that, you know, the earth is 5,000 some years old. Uh, God's creation uh, is perfect. Um, and what are they thinking? I know that we know that we've heard about these might be dragons or whatnot, but we're beyond the age of you know, fantasy, if you will, people are scientifically right. trying to approach. So what, what are they thinking? What are the implications of this and the idea of extinction? Yeah, so those are great questions. And, you know, she is right at the beginning and, and where a lot of the really important, you know, changing changes in people's thinking about these questions is, is taking place. As you said, this is pre-Darwin. So, you know, Mary Anning was born in 1799 and died in 1847. Uh, Darwin was born in 1809 and then published his big book on the origin of species, um, which, you know, really made him famous in 1859. So he published yeah. that 12 years after Mary died. Um, and so this was all taking place before that, but it was taking place at this really crucial time when people were, were out there and they were making these discoveries and Mary was at the forefront of these discoveries. So while she was discovering things like uh, the ichthyosaurs and the plesiosaurs, um, there was there are other people discovering the first dinosaurs also in England around the same time. And so there was, there was just a lot of fascinating stuff happening. Uh, people didn't know what these were, right? And so the, the thing with, when, when you find those, those Belemnites or even the Ammonites, people could sort of fool themselves into thinking, well, maybe that's just some sort of weird pattern in the rock. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you find something like that plesiosaurus skeleton that you showed a moment ago, or that ichthyosaur skeleton, people recognize this is not just some weird pattern of the rock um, because it, those, those, those fossils looked enough like you know, current living things that people recognize those must be the remains of living thing. And yet at the same time, they're so different from anything alive now. They told people that no, they must be something that is now extinct. And so that was a really, really important breakthrough is this idea of extinction because um, at that time, when Mary was uh, making her discoveries, um, you know, people had, didn't believe that extinction took place because, you know, to, to, to accept the idea of extinction would be accepting the idea because they also believed that all of creation was, you know, was made at, you know, at one time uh, by God. And that would be saying God's creation was somehow imperfect, that God would have let 
some things go extinct, that, that they would disappear. So she wasn't the first one to argue, to provide evidence for extinction, but her evidence was really important because there was a French, um, compar great co French comparative anatomist named Georges Cuvier, who had actually argued for extinction before uh, Mary came along the scene, uh, uh, just a few decades before that, because he described fossil mammoths. And you know people recognize they're similar to elephants, but they're different enough that they must have been their own species. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't, you know, people still argue, well, maybe, and you know, Thomas Jefferson believed this, for example, um, that maybe mammoths are still alive somewhere in the Western US or somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. But when Mary comes along and finds the, the ichthyosaur and then the plesiosaur, people recognize that, and, and the pterosaur, that they recognize these things are really big. I mean, a mammoth is big too, of course, mm -hmm. but they're so different. They, they can't be still alive somewhere on the earth. And so people recognize that these now must be extinct. extinct. So it really, it really stressed this idea that extinction was a fact of life, basically. And, and they, did, they had no way of dating these in any accurate sense, but they knew they were old. They knew they were old. And so at the same time this was taking place, people were starting to put piece together the, the age of the earth. And so there was a Scottish uh, geologist, the father of geology named James Hutton, who um, was alive during some of the same time that Mary was, he, pre he predated her slightly. And you know he had been making the argument that if you look around the earth and see the enormous amount of strata there is on the earth, like these cliffs on Lyme Regis, but you just put, you find cliffs like that all over the world. And he and others started arguing that that told them that the earth must be really, really old. I mean, some people had argued that all this, all these deposits were laid down by the biblical flood. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but they recognized that, that can't, that can't be true uh, yeah. for a number of reasons. And, and the other thing that Mary's discoveries stressed is that an idea that, again, this guy Cuvier had, had argued for is her data showed that there was this time that Cuvier had speculated about that he referred to as the age of reptiles that preceded what he called the age of mammals. And so we now know that was this period of the, you know, the Jurassic and the Cretaceous and before the Triassic when you had things like dinosaurs, these ichthyosaurs, these plesiosaurs and so forth um, that dominated the world before there were any mammals around. Uh, of course, as we now know, there were mammals around, but they were really small and, and uh, weren't really um, important uh, players on the, on the scene as far as we know. So th this also got people thinking in terms of, you know, these discoveries are really critical to the emergence of Darwin's ideas a few decades later on evolution because they really got people thinking about how life had been changing you know things had gone extinct but also things had been changing you know how how living things were were um you know the living things that were present yeah. at different points in time the so mark was working really, on ideas critical... like that but in a different vein right at the time right. that's right so i i think this is an interesting picture i understand uh what can you tell us about the uh, Duria and Tiquio? Yeah, so I, I love this picture. Um, this is so. This is a, a friend of Mary's, Henry de la Beach, um, and he was born. He grew up in Lyme Regis, um, and he they were friends. He was a few years older than Mary. Um, uh, he was a he became a professional geologist. Uh, so he was like the first president of the Geological Society of of, of uh, Great Britain, um, and. Um, he 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 drew this uh, painting, um, as you can see there in 1830, uh, to highlight Mary's discoveries. All right, so you see the the in the middle there, you see the ichthyosaur chomping on the neck of a plesiosaur. You see the pterosaurs in the air. Are those um, to scale, some, David? Are they? <laughs> um, pretty much they are. Actually, is that right? So pretty the ichthyosaur was that much yeah. bigger than the plesiosaur. Yeah. So he sort of playfully in the middle there, I don't know if you can see it, but he's also showing another discovery that Mary made, which is the coprolites, uh, coprolites. So you can see the plesiosaur, you see the brown lumps coming out. So that's like the feces. And so Mary had found these brown fossilized lumps and she discovered that those were actually fossilized feces by looking into them and finding their scales of fish and stuff in there. So he's showing that as well. So he, he made this painting to highlight her work, but he also made this painting um, the sale, um, and then use the proceeds of that sale um, to give to Mary, uh, because she was basically impoverished all of her life. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, he did two really nice things with this painting, um, you know, again, highlighting her work, but also making, uh, you know, benefiting her financially. 
Um, and so what's nice about that picture, by the way, is it's really the first depiction, I mean, we take this for granted, but it's kind of the first depiction also of how, you know, living things interacted, you know, and yeah. so you're seeing things like predation here, you know, and, and before that time, I mean, people didn't really think about it that way, you know, and so he's showing these, these different organisms all interacting they're part of an ecosystem basically I, I remember as a child there was always that disconnect between dinosaur bones and what our imagination wanted to do and you know and so it was sort of uh, the genre was you know we look at these skeletons then we turn the page and there's this panorama of like a tropical kind of scene and there's a volcano in the background and dinosaurs probably of different eras all mingling with each other but you know right. hopefully they were accurate right. but certainly it it kicked off an entire genre of art, you know, the imagination right. of the past like this. Right. And, and, and speaking of which, so De La Beige made prints of this, right? And so he, it wasn't just the original he sold, it was the prints that he also sold. So he had the idea to make copies of his painting and then, you know, sell those copies and then the proceeds of those went to Mary. Can we look at him as, so we can look at him as the forerunner of an entire genre of art that has I, continued? Yes. I think we can, yeah. Fantastic, that's fascinating. So we're coming up towards a point where we're gonna to need to go to some questions, but I wanna make sure we cover uh, uh, Mary's life. Life of hard work focused on this, focused on any other interests that she had or that we know much about other things she might've done, her religious life or? So she was a dissenter for nearly all of her life. She ended up joining the Church of England towards the end of her life. Um, she had many friends. I mean, so Henry de la Beige was a friend of hers. She had a, a, a number of uh, women friends. So she uh, had a close friendship with a woman named Elizabeth Philpot, who also, like Mary, never married. Um, and they were about the same age. And Elizabeth Philpot also liked looking for fossils. And so they spent a lot of time um, together looking for fossils. But that was really her life. She never ventured out of Lyme Regis except for one occasion when she went to London um, to see some of her fossils when she, you know, old, later in life when she was in her, I believe in her early 40s. So just um, go roll back that one. So she goes to London and her fossils are on display in London. Her fossils are on display. And but her name get, is nowhere to be seen. And right? no recognition. She just goes right. to say and, and, and someone's name is on there, sir so-and-so or scientist right, right, right. now. Yeah. Right. So one of the and one of the remarkable things is that you know no British scientist during her lifetime named anything after her, and that's in contrast to some of the other prominent uh, geologists who used her finds. So a guy named William Buckland, a, another guy named Robert Murchison, who actually used her finds, and they many fossils were named after them. Um, and the only fossils that were named after her in her lifetime were a couple of fish fossils and they were named by uh, a guy named Louis Agassi, who was a Swiss geologist who immigrated to America and became uh, sort of the founding father of the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. And so he's the only one who named anything after her. So she got basically almost no recognition, you know, in her lifetime by, by the scientific world. How, what do we know about the end of her life? How did she die? So she died um, in 1847 at the age of 47. Um, she died of breast cancer and um, she had known about, she had discovered this lump on her breast um, a, a few years earlier than that. Um, it, 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 she, you know, kept hoping it would go away. Of course, it never went away. And, and they had no treatment at painful. that point? They had no treatment at that time. Um, Lumpectomy? Uh, apparently not and at yeah. that time apparently they they wouldn't even if a doctor discovered that they wouldn't even tell the woman they might tell her husband you know but they wouldn't even tell her about it and so she she pretty much died in in agony i mean apparently it was very painful um mm. and here you see her grave marker and one of the reasons i i find this kind of poignant is that you could you see she doesn't even get recognition on her gravestone you know so it's like you know it's like to the memory of joseph anning that's her older brother uh, and then it says below it uh, and also. also to and also to his uh, children who died in infancy infancy yeah. and then at the very bottom also of mary anning his sister um yeah. uh, who you can see died two years before he did in 1847 uh he died as i said in 18, 1849 as you can see there um so you know she 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 died she had a very tough life basically and and um you know the end was not couldn't have been pleasant for her either when um, did she begin to get recognition 
So, I mean, she got, she started receiving some recognition in her lifetime. I mean, the fact that, you know, that painting you showed at the beginning, yeah. 1842. And so, you know, you, if you were a nobody, nobody, nobody would be making a painting of you, right? You were yeah. literally nobody. So she was, she was very well known in the geological circles and the paleontological circles in Britain and Europe and in America. Um, so, you know, Darwin certainly knew who she was, for example. This, again, Louis Agassiz named these fish after her, and he became, you know, the father, uh, you know, he, he really was the founder of sort of Harvard as Harvard, you know, in terms of in biology and evolution, um, and a very prominent scientist. Um, so she gets, people know who she is, but she doesn't get the recognition that would normally come to somebody mm -hmm. at, who, like her who made these prominent discoveries and again it's probably because she was female um it probably also has to do with the, her her um you know her social status you know as a as a as both a dissenter but also as a, as a fairly impoverished person you know so most of the people were not just men at this time but they were also aristocrats right and so yeah. this was a time when you know i'm very fortunate and then i get and, and i try to never forget this right that i get paid uh to study what I'm interested in, right? So, and teach about evolution, right? And study evolution. Back then, you had to have a, you had to have a job, right? You had to be yeah. a cabinet maker or a hatter or something like that. Um, or you had to be independently wealthy. So Darwin, yeah. for example, was independently wealthy. His father was a prominent doctor and, yeah. and, and that's how Darwin was able to do what he did. So it probably had something to do with that as well. Now, some of the men also had maybe similar backgrounds to Mary, but you know, they weren't dissenters. They were able to go to university. They, yeah. Many of them were in the clergy and they made a living that way and they moved up the circle. There was a hint of meritocracy in the 19th century if you checked Absolutely. off the boxes of Absolutely. male educated, Absolutely. you know, so yeah, for sure. But, well, but she, she's she is getting credit nowadays. So you asked, you know, so there have been a number of books that have come out. Um, you know, she's. This is really neat that she was uh, a few years ago. They they polled the uh, the Royal Society, which is one of the world's you know premier uh, uh, scientific societies. Um, polled a panel of experts about uh, who were the most prominent women in British history uh, to have an influence on science, and you can see that um, she was one of those. Um, 10 influential women. So you, you can see you, Mary Anning's highlighted there. You had mentioned some recent books. Do you want to hold those up for us and we can share yeah, the links so, with those? So um, there's this nice book by um, uh, Shelley Emling uh, on, uh, called The Fossil Hunter. And so this is a biography of, of Mary. Um, and I really like this book. It's, a, it's, it's, it's well done. It's well researched. Um, and it, it's, it's well written too. And so you can you know breeze through this uh, pretty quickly. Um, and then another book that I like about her is this book by uh, Tracy Chevalier that came out a few years ago called Remarkable Creatures. This is more of a, a kind of a historical novel. And so it's based on, you know, some, you know, real facts about Mary, but some of it's somewhat yeah. speculative. So it's really a lot about her relationship with Elizabeth Philpott that we talked about earlier. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of the books that have been written about Mary before these two were mostly targeted at kids, you know, because it was kind of this neat story that, you know, this this girl fossil hunter, right? And so, well, you know, which brings us to one which might be apocryphal, but people, and that's why when Paul was playing the music, he was playing an instrumental piece, but the piece was called "She Sells." She, I see, that's you know, the tongue twister. People have said it it's, might be about Mary Anning. Some she, people say it might be about her. She sells seashells at the seashore. Right? You're good. I can't. Some some people say that's a that's apocryphal. Um, apparently, there's a new there's a new movie that came out about her called Ammonite. I haven't seen it, so it it uh, features Kate Winslet as uh, Mary. Um, oh. So I guess it, it it's it, it premiered at the end of 2020. Oh, um, its release, I guess, was delayed because of the, the pandemic. OK, um, well, maybe we can look forward to that. Yeah, maybe we can find a link to that and, and put that in the chat if it exists or find out when it's coming out. Um, we do have to save room for questions. I just want to quickly go through some of these other ways that she is certainly being recognized today. This is in Lyme Regis, right? So mm -hmm. if you go to Lyme Regis, you'll see this, right? The, um, and this is her house, right? Where So is this mm -hmm. where she lived while she was doing all of that? Fossil that's hunting. right. Yeah. yeah. And she had a, that's where she had her shop too. Was that inherited from her parents? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
She and ended right, up moving to a new house as she in, later in life, but she initially lived in the house with her parents. And, and this museum has been built there. Is, have you been to this right. museum? I have not. No, I've okay. actually sadly never been to Lyme Rages. Okay, it's in. Well, put it on your bucket list and yeah. use that bucket to collect fossils. Um, we have uh, also. I just want to just say, in 2021, it looks like the Royal Mint has also come on board in celebrating Mary Anning here with 50p coins in honor of them. And there's the Dimorphodon, obviously one of the pterosaurs that she found, and the the Pleosaurus that we all have been talking about. That's a different name for the Ichthyosaurus, the Temnodontosaurus. Is that a different animal? So it's the same animal. That's the that's the name, the genus name of the species that okay. it belongs to. And Ichthyosaurs are the larger group that they belong to. So there are multiple species and number multiple genera within that group. So that's what that name refers to. But that is her that's her discovery. And you can see there it says 1811. That's when okay. So it shows uh, the actual she year she discovered these. Yeah. And so they have a pretty good record of she kept a pretty good record or uh, or I mean I guess I'm asking you this. Do we have a pretty good record of when she discovered things based on yes. the sales that yes. she made them? And yes. Very yes. interesting. So I'd be fascinating to see just how prolific she was, you know, look at that list of, of, uh, of fossils and the years. Um, David, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you for bringing uh, uh, Mary to us. I'm absolutely someone I think everyone is going to um, want to find out more about. And we have, look, this film, we have Ammonite is available to rent on Amazon Prime. So go out tonight to look for something to do. Um, and uh, Fanta, oh, and then of course, thank you, Paul. He's put down some wonderful links there to those uh, those various uh, books you you uh, mentioned as well. Um, let's uh, go to our question. How about that, David? You like that? Okay. Yeah, Rita asks, uh, do we know why so many fossils were found there? Did the harbor exist a hundred million years ago? Is the geographic <laughs> area responsible for the large deposit of fossils, or is it no development in that region over the last thousand years, so nothing disturbed it there? What is the so relationship there? Basically, where fossils are found on the Earth is really sort of a fluke of history, right? And so, um, presumably, these um, ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs were, in fact, we're pretty certain they were all over the world because you find fossils of them in like Mexico and you know Asia and all over. Um, it just so happens that this area around Lyme Regis has preserved a record of that time, you know, in terms of the rocks that are still there. So, um, you know, for instance, we could have had potentially rocks of that age here, perhaps, you know, around this area in North Carolina, but then later on, they may have gotten eroded off. And so they're not around for scientists to come along later on and discover it. So it's where the rocks were deposited at that time. So it had to be an area where deposition would take place, you know, so it had to be like a, a shallow marine environment where these creatures could live. So it couldn't be like a mountaintop or a desert or something like that. But then those rocks had to survive all this time, you know, to over 140 million years later for somebody to come along and find. Um, but it's also true that they also had to be, you know, accessible somehow. And so there are some amazing fossils, for instance, right around where we live here in Chapel Hill, but you can only get to them, you know, when somebody builds a quarry. And even then, you got to be able to get permission from the quarry owner to let you go in there and look for the fossils. So, yeah. so this area now in Lyme Regis is a World Heritage Site now. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. So it's protected, you know, from development. But you can go there and you can find fossils. And so you can find the ammonites, you know, on the beach there. Um, as I said, I haven't been there, but, I, you know, Kren, my spouse, went there. And, and just there are fossils everywhere that you can find. And there's a whole sort of tourist industry, even now uh, in 2021, built up around that. A um, hundred Mary Annings and Lyme Regis selling. Yes, uh, yes, yes. You know, it's interesting about that relationship between biology and geology. I know even just from, you know, finding oh, I, in Vermont when they found a, a whale uh, fossil and realizing, wait, there was, we don't have whales in Lake Champlain, so this must have mm -hmm. been an inner sea that's an interesting relationship using geolog because obviously these fish didn't swim up onto the cliffs to die right, right you know right, right. and they were clearly marine animals from what they were judging by the flipper shape and things like right. that so that's an interesting relationship that the that these biological evidence or biological le legacies lead to geological insights Right, and probably the most spectacular example of that is that, and again, I've never been there, and I probably will never get there, but at the very top of Mount Everest, the highest point on the planet, 
are fossil shells, right? And so that tells us that those rocks must have once been underwater and they've wow. been pressed up over five miles now high above the, the sea level. Um, so it's telling us how the earth is, not just life, but the earth has changed um, dramatically over time. Wow, really absolutely fascinating. Well, folks, we're going to uh, come to an end here pretty soon. I will uh, give an opportunity if anyone has any final questions, give you a couple minutes. But in the meantime, David, I want to thank you and just uh, get a sense of what, is, what are you working on now in your biology? What's uh, most exciting to you right now? Well, so um, I, I'm an evolutionary biologist. And what I really want to understand is how how the ability of organisms to respond in their lifetimes to the changing circumstances that they experience, how that affects evolution, right? So we call this phenomenon plasticity, you know, so where organisms can change their shape or their behavior or their physiology. Is, in is some this way also in epigenetics? Is that? Epigenetics and plasticity are, are, are um, not quite one and the same, but they're very closely related. And so you're, you're quite right about that. And so epigenetic is a mechanism that could cause plasticity. And so what I'm really interested in is how plasticity comes about, um, but how it also impacts evolution. We're also interested in, you know, how it affects um, ecology and even how it affects human health, you know, and so it's just, it's, a, it's kind of an understudied topic, I think, in biology. It's becoming more um, uh, interesting to many people, but it's, I think it's an area that, you know, we've got these genomes now, we've done all the, the age of genomics, and we've discovered that understanding the sequence of DNA of an organism doesn't tell us a lot about how that organism actually functions in the real world. And so we're understanding that that's the interplay between genes and environment that are really, really critical. And that's what we're trying to understand more about um, well, is, that, is that interplay. Well, that's fascinating stuff. And we do hope that you can come back to a Carolina Public Humanities event and we can find a way to talk about that in an interdisciplinary way. We certainly can, and you're always welcome. Um, David, this has been fascinating. Thank you for bringing Mary to our attention. Really, I mean, I just My love pleasure. to see it. You're, it's zeitgeist film and everything. So we're just, we're, we're hitting it where we need to hit it. So thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank all of you for joining us. Uh, we have two more Lunch with Friends and Strangers, including, uh, uh, Aaron Copeland next week, a uh, famous, of course, American composer, and Darcy McNichol, a, an American uh, Indian activist, writer, uh, and uh, a fascinating figure. So we have those on the next two Fridays coming. And of course, go to YouTube. You can find all of the old ones there on YouTube, including our spring roster, which we will be opening up for public um, at the beginning of July. Uh, that'll uh, add another seven to the, uh, to the mix. And uh, you'll be able to catch this again uh, on YouTube in about six months' time. So, uh, David, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. My pleasure. It's been a pleasure seeing you in 2D. Hopefully, we'll see you in 3D soon enough. Um, go to humanities.unc.edu, sign up, line up for our programs. We'd love to see you at our Conceptions of Time, which we kind of hit on a little bit here, didn't we, today? Mm -hmm. uh, that seminar coming up should be absolutely fascinating with a look at um, astrophysics, religion, and history and society, three different ways that uh, conceptions of time have had a real impact on our own conceptions of ourself. Uh, that's what we do here at Humanities, uh, at Carolina Public Humanities. Uh, we've had a successful run here today. David, thank you so much for joining us. Give our best to Karin as well. I will. Okay, bye-bye everybody. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.